Hello? That's it. Okay. I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the College of Architecture and Planning to tonight's Monday Night Lecture, which is also a part of Women's Week. We are privileged tonight to have a guest speaker from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, who is Andrea Furster, not Andrea, that's Andrea, who is Assistant General Counsel to the National Trust. Andrea holds a JD degree from George Washington University, the National Law Center, and she also holds a BA degree from Sarah Lawrence College. Andrea has been with the National Trust as their Assistant Counsel since 1989. So I would like to welcome Andrea Furster, and I would also like to remind all of you that Andrea will be participating as part of a panel on women in the design professions tomorrow from 1 until 3. Thank you. Well, thank you for the generous introduction. I, I feel like I'm back in law school now with all you, everybody back benching over there. Um, you can move up if you want. I'm not going to ask any questions. Um, and in fact, I'm going to try and leave some time to answer questions if you have any. Um, six months ago, I would have been able to give you what I thought was a more definitive picture of current issues in preservation law. But since that time, we've been presented with a series of cases, two of which are now pending before the U.S. Supreme Court, and one is pending before a state Supreme Court, um, which could set back the efforts of local communities to protect historic landmarks with strong preservation laws. So for that reason, my lecture tonight is going to focus on what we're calling the property rights debate. And keep in mind that this is a debate that's still going on, so I don't have any answers yet. Um, although I will try to provide you with some, some focus for the discussion. I'm also going to spend a little bit of time talking about another current constitutional issue, and that is the extent to which um, religious properties can be protected by preservation laws. And uh, that if I have any time left after that, um, I'm going to just briefly go through some new developments in federal preservation law, including the new surface transportation law that was just passed by Congress this December. Now, before I get into the current property rights cases, I want to give you some background that hopefully will put the issues into more focus. Um, and this is where I get a little legal, so I hope you all don't fall asleep. Um, the legal framework for the property rights debate is, is provided by the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution called the Takings Clause. And that clause provides very simply that the government cannot take private property for public use without providing just compensation. The simplest example of a taking, uh, of a, the application of the Takings Clause is a, the, the, phys, the direct physical acquisition of the site of a site by the government, such as the purchase of a, um, of a historic battlefield for a national park. Even, even when the government only physically takes a piece of your property, for example, a few yards of your front, if, front yard for a highway right-of-way, you're still entitled to compensation for that piece of your property that was taken, um, even though you still have your home and the use of your yard. But the issues come a lot, become a lot less clear when you're talking about government regulatory programs that may affect the value of your property by restricting its uses, but that don't take your property outright. Um, in the past, Supreme Court decisions have held that legitimate government regulations that will not amount to a taking of private property, and therefore there's no need to provide compensation unless they remove all economically viable use of a property taken as a whole. Just to, to give a zoning example, um, a property owner can't argue that a setback requirement takes the 16 feet of, of, the, of their yard um, that they no longer can build on um, because instead they still, again, they have their house and they, they still have a, a, a viable use of their property. So the issue 
Um, the issue of measuring the value of the parcel as a whole is one of the main issues that, that I'm going to focus on because that's one of the questions that's under attack now by some of these current cases. Now, in terms of preservation law, uh, the watershed moment for preservation came in 1978 when the U.S. Supreme Court was presented with the question of whether historic preservation regulation affected a taking. And that's the historic Penn Central decision that many of you have probably heard about. And the Penn Central case concerned the Grand Central Station Terminal in New York City, which is, was and is a magnificent Beaux-Arts building that's really only a few stories high. Now, obviously, a building in New York City that's only a few stories high in many people's eyes is a a waste of valuable airspace, and that's what the owners of the Penn Central Terminal um, thought. Um, they submitted an application to the New York City Landmarks Commission to request permission to build a 50-story office tower on top of the terminal, and this project would have virtually destroyed the integrity of this, this building. So the New York City Landmarks Commission refused to allow them to go forward with that project. Penn Central then immediately brought suit, um, claiming that New York City had effectively taken its property um, by uh, preventing it from utilizing the air rights over its building. So the case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which in a decision by now retired Justice Brennan established what we thought firmly was firmly the constitutionality of historic preservation regulation. Um, first, the court laid to rest the notion that aesthetic regulation isn't a legitimate um, government purpose. Um, the decision noted that over 500 communities had enacted some form of preservation law and that preservation regulations enhance the quality of life by preserving the character and desirable aesthetic features of a city. And the, co the court also held that the since the Grand Central Terminal was still a viable railroad station, no taking had occurred, even though Penn Central couldn't build on the air rights, and um, obviously the value of its property was greatly diminished. So, in other words, the, ten, pe the takings clause protected Penn Central's right to a reasonable economic use of their property as a whole, but not the right to make essentially a windfall profit from the development of their air rights. Now, the Penn Central decision did not entirely close the door on takings challenges to preservation regulations. Property owners could still go to court and argue that a particular decision by a preservation commission when it denied a permit or a certificate of appropriateness to make some kind of alterations um, or demolish their landmark um, could result in an economic hardship that was sufficient to destroy the entire value of the property for them and therefore was a complete taking of their property um, under the Penn Central decision. Um, and for that reason, most preservation ordinances do contain what's called a hardship provision um, that uh, is a mechanism for um, granting administrative relief um, from the application of preservation restrictions um, in the case of demonstrated economic hardship. Now, since 19, the 1978 Penn Central decision, the preservation movement has grown literally by leaps and bounds. And um, at last count, we were up to 1,700 communities that had enacted some form of preservation regulation as compared to the 500 that existed in 1978. And of course, all 50 states also has some form of preservation regulation. So perhaps naively, um, those of us in the field of preservation advocacy thought that the takings issue had been essentially resolved. And we turned our attention to developing refinements and incentives um, in, in preservation areas. For example, protecting religious properties and protecting the interiors of historic buildings, which present more difficult preservation issues that I'm going to go into later, or just increasing the availability of funding or tax incentives for preservation projects. But at the same time as the preservation movement was growing, um, the environmental movement was experiencing a backlash from the so-called property rights advocates, who claimed that a whole range of environmental laws unfairly restricted their ability to use their property um, as they saw fit. And last summer, we in the preservation field got our first taste of the property rights battle 
it, it's amazing how this whole thing lends itself to military jargon. We're always talking about battles and fights and skirmishes. Um, it's feeling like war out there. But anyway, we're in the thick of it now. Um, and the vehicle was a relatively innocuous case making its way through the Pennsylvania courts called United Artists versus the City of Philadelphia. And the case on its face concerned whether the Philadelphia Landmarks Commission had the legal authority to designate the Art Deco interior of the historic Boyd Theater, which was located in downtown Philadelphia. Um, the case eventually made its way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And as we can see now in hindsight, I think, the case lent itself very well to the rhetoric of the property rights advocates. The theater owner had argued that the designation of the interior of the theater was so restrictive that the owner was prohibited from moving a mirror from one side of the wall to another without the permission of the Philadelphia Landmarks Commission. And you know, nothing is more unsettling than the image of the government inside of your home. Still, um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's decision was a very rude awakening. The court ignored the whole issue of interior designations altogether and instead issued a sweeping ruling declaring that any landmark designation of a, a historic property without the owner's consent on its face with the taking of private property um, requiring compensation. Since the Penn Central decision barred this interpretation under the federal constitution, the Pennsylvania court neatly avoided that by issuing its decision under their state constitution, which also had a takings clause. And as a result, this decision is completely insulated from any kind of um, further review by the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, the United Artists decision understandably sent the entire preservation and planning communities um, in, in the state of P Pennsylvania into a complete tailspin. Um, suddenly, Pennsylvania um, all cities and towns in Pennsylvania, not just Philadelphia, were faced with the prospect that their future and the more troubling, their past regulatory decisions um, could subject their governments to thousands of dollars in damages as part of takings claims. And city attorneys in that climate were understandably very reluctant to advise local preservation commissions uh, to continue to designate and regulate historic properties in that climate. Um, the National Trust was instrumental in orchestrating a legal response. We filed briefs on behalf of a number of national and local organizations, including the American Planning Association, the American Institute of Architects, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, um, and we asked the court, the Pennsylvania court, to reconsider its decision, which is something, incidentally, the courts rarely do. So I'm happy to say that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court did agree to reconsider its opinion, although it has not yet issued a new decision. Um, and in fact, there's some speculation that the Pennsylvania court is, um, is waiting for the U.S. Supreme Court to decide the takings cases that are before it that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But regardless of what happens in the United Art Artists case, it's clear that there are even greater threats to preservation which are being presented in the political and legislative arenas. First, it was really amazing how fast um, word of the United Artists decision spread around the country. It did not matter that the United Artists decision was literally a maverick decision, completely out of the mainstream of preservation law and takings law under both state constitutions and other states as well as under the federal constitution. Suddenly, United Artists, rather than Penn Central, was being cited by property owners all over the country as the dispositive authority um, for the argument that local governments could not constitutionally designate and regulate historic properties. Um, and the tactic that they took was to urge legislative bodies to incorporate what are called owner consent requirements in preservation ordinance. In other words, you can't designate um, a property as a landmark if the owner objects, um, which makes preservation purely voluntary, which in our view is a giant leap backwards in preservation law. Um, this became the focus of another major property rights battle. Um, and this one took place in the legislative arena in Virginia, and I'm going to take some time to go into that because our concern is that it's just a forerunner of things to come in other states. 
Um, the battle, again, military jargon, the battle was sparked by the landmark designation of the Brandy Station Civil War Battlefield, which was a, an extraordinarily pristine cultural landscape, which was the site of one of the largest cavalry battles um, fought in the Civil War. Um, the, the, the property was purchased by California developers for a proposed shopping mall and office retail complex. Um, the developers in this case were very politically influential and they succeeded in getting a bill introduced in the Virginia legislature which not only would de-designate the Brandy Station battlefield but would prevent the Virginia Historic Review Board which was a state um, agency that designated historic properties from designating any property as, as historic unless the owner or in the case of a historic district a majority of owners consented to the designation. And the bill was a showcase for the power of the property rights lobby. They literally came into the state um, with a team of very well-paid, well-organized, well-funded lobbyists with very, I have to admit, very compelling rhetoric. They argued that landmark designation was a tremendous burden on small property owners. They specifically pointed to small family farmers as sort of their poster children, who as a result of landmark designation could only get a fraction of the price of, for their land that their, neighboring, their, that their neighbors were getting. In fact, this argument was factually incorrect since landmark designation by the state of Virginia was, was not didn't have, not, didn't have a regulatory effect. It was an honorific designation. But still, they, they effectively made the point that preservation was just not fair. And in the political arena, scholarly legal analysis about what the takings claw really means is virtually useless. It didn't seem to help either to point out that the major purpose of the proposed bill was not to help the small property owners, but really to protect the ability of developers to realize windfall profits on speculative land deals. Anyway, the bill passed in both houses of Virginia, and now it's before Governor Wilder for signing. Um, although preservationists were able to defang it somewhat by taking out some of its more outrageous provisions. But again, this issue does crystallize the, tacti the effectiveness of the tactics of the property rights advocates. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it, um, uh, not just on the state level, but on the local level where it's not uh, as highly publicized and where the arguments, uh, where there's not as much of an ability on the part of preservationists to come in and counter their arguments. Um, if I were to sum up the lessons we've learned from the Virginia and Philadelphia battles, it would have to be that legal arguments are not enough, and this is a difficult thing for a lawyer to say. Um, instead, the preservation and planning communities are going to have to develop ways to respond to the very appealing arguments that are being made by property rights advocates that preservation regulation is not fair. Um, one, one important thing that can be done to lessen some of the perceived unfairness of preservation regulation is to make sure that preservation ordinances actually protect property interests. And at the National Trust, we have been in the process of advising local governments to build into their local ordinances protections to property interests when they're in the process of enacting new ordinances or revising their ordinances. Um, we suggest that these protections should, first of all, include good procedures such as mailed written notice to property owners of a proposed landmark des designation, ideally a public hearing, and other procedures so that the property owners don't feel as if they're being treated unfairly or, or summarily. Um, an ordinance should also have a very good provision for granting relief administratively um, from restrictions that have been placed on the landmark property in the case of demonstrated economic hardship. And that the ordinance should include a standard um, that is tied to the U.S. Supreme Court's taking standard. And then finally, ideally, state with fun when funds permit, state and local governments should develop incentive programs um, such as tax credits, transfer development rights, and preservation funding so that landmark designation comes with a carrot as well as a stick. Um, one area that the National Trust is also looking into um, is how we can demonstrate what are the countervailing public benefits of preservation regulation. 
so that we can make our case more effectively as a policy matter. Um, one, one example of um, benefits is, comes out in a study that we sponsored of historic Fredericksburg, which is a town in Virginia that dates back to the Revolutionary War. Um, we, um, we sponsored a study that tracked property values both before uh, the designation of a historic district and then after the designation, and the study showed that the designation actually increased the value of the uh, of property. Um, in addition, while, while development projects are often touted um, as bringing economic benefits in the form of new businesses and jobs that justifies the destruction of historic properties. It's often overlooked that this economic benefit also brings increased infrastructure costs um, to the government by new development in terms of sewers and roads and schools. And then the economic benefits of heritage tourism are also often overlooked, even though it's estimated that as a nation we spend um, every year an increasing percent of, the, uh, of our income on tourism. Anyway, in the meantime, as we're fighting all these legislative battles and we're recovering from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision, the U.S. Supreme Court got into the action. And it has decided now to re review two cases in which the lower courts had refused to find re that certain regulatory actions constituted a taking. Um, and I'm going to go into the facts again of these cases in, a, in some somewhat detail, and I hope it won't be too dry, but I think it's worth doing because the U.S. Supreme Court you know, very rarely takes cases, particularly when you have a very strong um, precedent in the area of takings law already established. So the fact that it is um, granted a petition for certiorari in two cases, um, some feel signals um, a potential interest on the part of the a very conservative federal judiciary now, and perhaps going back on this Penn Central principles. Um, and in fact, uh, one of these the concerns that is uh, perhaps justified by the fact that only two of the six judges who are in the majority in the Penn Central case are still sitting on the Supreme Court now, and two of the two of the three dissenters. Um, Justices Rehnquist and Justice Stevens are still on the court, and of course Justice Rehnquist wrote a dissenting opinion in the Penn Central case, so now he's the Chief Justice. Um, then the five new sitting justices are considered very uh, conservative and considered likely to um, side with Justice Rehnquist on the takings issue. The first of the cases is called um, Yee versus City of Escondido. And the Yee case involves a rent control ordinance that was passed by the city of Escondido in California that regulates mobile home parks. Um, the Escondido ordinance controls the rent mobile home park owners, that's the people who own the land underneath the mobile units, uh, controls the rent that they can charge on spaces within the park. Uh, under the ordinance, the owner is barred from raising the rents even after the existing tenants move out. In addition, the owner of the park is required by the ordinance to accept as a new tenant anybody who buys a mobile home from a present tenant. So this rent control situation uh, gave rise to a situation where the, the mobile home park owner, who owned the land but not the unit, was unable to realize any real prop property in rent after a lot turned over while the tenants who own the unit but not the land were perceived as reaping a substantial windfall in the sale of their homes um, because they could sell it for so much more money than they were worth, worth due to the desirability of the rent-controlled park. The owner of the mobile home park, Mr. and Mrs. Yee, claimed that their property was taken without compensation, notwithstanding the fact that the ordinance guaranteed them a fair and reasonable rent. The Yees argued that but for the rent control ordinance, the supposed windfall profit that the tenants um, of the mobile home park were able to realize on the sale of their units would have been theirs in the form of the increased rent that they could have charged. And the owner argued that this resulted in a taking um, in the amount of that transferred premium. Now, it, it's fair to ask what do rent control ordinances and mobile home parks do with preservation law? And the answer lies in the legal arguments that were made by Mr. and Mrs. Yee. And these arguments attack Penn Central's 
fundamental principle that in, ter in determining whether a regulation has deprived an owner of all economically viable use of property, you need to look at the whole parcel, the parcel as a whole. Loss of a single property interest, whether it's the air rights over the building or the premium from the um, sale of rental units, is not enough. The real danger in the Yee case is the attempt by the owners of the mobile home park to equate regulatory control with a physical taking. And if you recall in the United Artists case, um, the court actually suggested that a preservation commission, the Preservation Commission's control over the Art Deco interior of the Boyd Theater was so pervasive that it amounted to being a physical occupation of the property. And if, if you have a physical occupation of the property, you get compensation for that diminution in the value of your property. You don't need to be deprived of the uh, property as a whole. So that was the danger, even though the Yees could set, uh, had a reasonable return on their investment if the regulation was so onerous that it could be equated to a physical taking, they could get compensation. Now the second takings case before the U.S. Supreme Court is called Lucas versus South Carolina Coastal Council. And I think this is the case that's received the most publicity. Um, the Lucas case involved the question of whether a regulation that barred construction on oceanfront property on South Carolina's coast was a taking. In that case, Mr. Lucas had purchased uh, two homes on, a, on the barrier island in, on the coast of South Carolina, um, paying close to $1 million in 1986. Um, he planned to use one as his home and one he planned to sell. In 1988, two years later, South Carolina passed a law regulating the construction of structures on critical coastal areas, areas in order to prevent the harm that results to inland property from coastal erosion, harm that was very vividly illustrated by Hurricane Hugo a year later. Um, the regulation without dispute destroyed almost all of the value of the property for Mr. Lucas since he couldn't build anything on the property except perhaps a boardwalk. And he argued that the regulation completely took his property and he demanded compensation of over one million dollars. Um, and again, this case has another unfairness aspect of it because Mr. Lucas bought the land two years before the regulation essentially downzoned the property. Um, and while it was worth $1 million in 1986, it was worth nearly nothing to him anyway um, in 1988. The South Carolina Supreme Court, however, held that um, it was not a taking. Um, the court held that the government has an absolute right to prevent a use of prop private property um, that would cause serious public harm. This is called the nuisance exception to the takings doctrine. It authorized the government to take actions such as destroying diseased trees or crack houses um, where, where an owner's use of the property will cause injury to the community. Um, the property rights advocate saw this case as an unwarranted expansion of the nuisance, nuisance exception and they could see any regulatory ordinance being justified as uh, preventing a serious public harm and therefore um, uh, avoiding any kind of compensation even where the regulation completely takes property. So they sought reversal by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, the Lucas case, I think, is troubling for preservationists and planners due to the concern that the case would be a vehicle for the U.S. Supreme Court to establish what are called a hierarchy of government actions um, to protect the public health and safety. Um, and in that case, aesthetic regulations, such as historic preservation or open space zoning, would probably be placed at the bottom of, the, of, the, uh, of that ladder. Um, and both of these cases are troubling for the reason that they do present uh, present the Supreme Court um, with um, situations in which the government action may not be technically a taking, but they're nonetheless perceived as being very unfair to property owners. And a, a famous, um, famous judge once said, hard cases make bad law. And it's entirely plausible that these cases will result in a, a langu language in the Supreme Court decisions that will provide further fuel for the property rights advocates' um, battles. And um, 
possibly will stimulate more property rights challenges to preservation regulations, particularly in the political and legislative arenas. Um, I don't mean to be overly pessimistic about these cases. Um, just judging from the questions that the Supreme Court um, justices were asking at the oral argument, um, it didn't seem like they were leaning toward making any real radical departures in takings law, but nonetheless the concern is still there. Turning now from state to church, um, a, a variation on the property rights issue is presented by the question of religious properties. These cases deal with the issue of the extent to which um, properties owned by religious institutions can be regulated by local preservation commissions. And in addition to the takings argument, religious property owners can invoke a very powerful legal tool, and that's the First Amendment um, free exercise clause. Um, three cases have dealt with this issue. The first case was the St. Bartholomew's case in New York City. And that case involved a historic seven-story parish house that was owned by uh, the St. Bart's Church. And the church wanted to demolish this parish house in order to build a 47-story office tower. Um, its seven-story parish house was used by the church um, for its social programs, including a soup kitchen and a daycare center. Um, the New York City Landmarks Commission refused to per, uh, grant them permission to demolish um, the parish house, and St. Barth's brought suit, um, claiming that the city's actions violated their First Amendment free exercise rights of religion. Um, St. Barth's also argued that the uh, city had taken its property. The case went up to the U.S. Supreme, not, not to the U.S. Supreme Court, to the Second Circuit Court of, the, of Appeals, um, which did uphold um, the Landmarks Commission's actions and um, uh, said that uh, uh, there was no infringement on the church's free exercise rights. At the same time, the Supreme Court of the State of Washington reached exactly the opposite conclusion. This was a case called the First Covenant Church case um, in, in Seattle, Washington. In that case, First Covenant Church had challenged the landmark designation of its church building, um, challenged the designation of the building on its face as a violation of its free exercise rights, even though the church had no current plans to make any alterations or changes in its, in a, in its building. Um, and the lower court dismissed the case, I think correctly, um, as having been brought prematurely, um, reasoning that the landmark designation alone didn't do anything except recognize the property's intrinsic historic qualities, and that it was impossible to tell whether the church would be injured unless and until it subsequently um, applied for a permit to either alter or demolish its property. The case then went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which completely reversed the lower court and held that landmark designation on its face violated the church's First Amendment free exercise rights. And again, this is a very sweeping decision because it literally canceled out all the landmark designations of all the churches in the state of Washington. Under the court's reasoning, the First Amendment absolutely protected the church's right to make any changes it saw fit to its building for whatever reason. In other words, if the church wanted to demolish its building in order to build a parking lot, the First Amendment protected that right. Now, the city of Seattle appealed the case to the U.S. Supreme Court at the same time as St. Bartholomew's Church appealed the opposite uh, ruling by the Second Cir Circuit to the U.S. Supreme Court. So both of these cases were before the U.S. Supreme Court at the same time. Um, in, uh, I guess it was in winter of 1990. Um, in March of 1991, the Supreme Court issued its decision. Um, and it, w it was a decision that was very favorable to preservation. The court refused to review St. Bart's, the St. Bart's case, which let stand um, the Second Circuit's case that there was no infringement on free exercise rights. But at the same time, the Supreme Court reversed the First Covenant decision and sent the case back to the Washington Supreme Court for reconsideration. So to, taken together, the Supreme Court action did send a very strong signal to religious property owners that they will not necessarily have a leg up in the property rights debate simply because of their status as a religious organization. But the victory, again, may be short-lived. 
in the, in the first covenant case, the case has been returned to the Washington Supreme Court, which has now heard oral argument. But the, case, the court is entertaining a request by the church that the case be decided in state constitutional grounds, which, as in the case, the United Artists case, this will insulate the decision from U.S. Supreme Court review. Meanwhile, um, in New York City, as well as in a number of other cities around the country, um, religious property owners are completely bypassing the courts, and what they're doing is they're going to their legislative bodies and requesting blanket exemptions um, from preservation laws. Again, not making legal arguments, but simply making a fairness argument, or you know, a free exercise fairness argument. And then the final case that makes up the trilogy of religious cases is one that involves the designation of an interior of a church. And interiors of a church involve very delicate issues, far more delicate than um, interiors of theaters. Um, the case arose when the owners, the Jesuit owners of um, the Immaculate Conception Church in Boston wanted to renovate the interior of their church to provide um, uh, office space uh, and living quarters for the Jesuit priests. And they intended to move their worship space down into the basement. The church, without any notice to the community, began interior demolition. And that was tremendously shocking because it was a magnificent interior. Um, and the way they went about the demolition was um, very complete. Um, there was no preservation at all in the way there was wooden pews were being smashed and crystal chan chandeliers were um, being destroyed. So the Landmarks Commission sort of jumped into the action to halt the demolition, but at the same time, um, they didn't simply impose preservation on the church. They structured a mediation process that was designed to work with the church and its architects to try and find a way that the church could accomplish the objective of its renovation um, without irreparably harming the interior. And, and it was a very successful mediation process. Ultimately, a compromise design um, was um, uh, agreed to, and the renovations went forward, and the Jesuits are now working and living in the, in the sanctuary of the church and carrying on their worship um, in the church as well. So by all accounts, it should be a success story, except that the Jesuits nonetheless went to court and um, sued to cancel the designation of their interior as a taking. Uh, uh, no, it was not a taking, as a violation of their free exercise rights of religion. Um, and this time, the state Supreme Court, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, uh, sided with the religious property owners, and they ruled that landmark designation of a church interior violated um, the church's free exercise rights of religion. And this time, again, they ruled under the state constitution, not the federal constitution. So there was no further review by the U.S. Supreme Court, and that's law in the state of Massachusetts. I'm going to try and sum up the property rights issues with some editorial opinions, which I will, of course, proceed with the disclaimer that these are not necessarily the views of the National Trust. Uh, first, I think that the the so-called property rights debate is not about family farmers or small property owners, and instead it's about whether the development community should be able to reap huge profits um, at the expense of the quality of life for the rest of us. As one commentator has put it, the developers want to pay BMW prices for a Yugo and then sue because they got a lousy car. Even so, it's clear that the justice of our cause alone is not going to be enough. As a lobby, the development community is better organized and much better funded. And that's why we, we would like to think that we can win the battle in court, because it presents a much more level playing field. However, even if there's no long-term damage that's done by the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in the Ian Lucas case, we have seen that state courts are willing to interpret their state constitution so as to provide greater protections for property rights than are guaranteed by the federal constitution. And if state courts aren't willing to do that, property rights advocates have free reign in their local legislative bodies. So preservationists need to learn, I think, what the rest of the country knew a long time ago, that you really can't depend on lawyers too much. And I'm going to get disbarred for that. Courts are considered anti-populist. And if the public doesn't like a court decision, no matter how scholarly and no matter how well-reasoned, they can just go to the political arena and get a different result. In the end, what we have to do in order to be effective advocates 
is to be effective advocates in the court of public opinion. Um, on the religious property issue, um, I have to say that I think blanket exemptions from preservation regulations are bad public policy. Most preservation regulations do contain an administrative mechanism for granting hardship relief that I think are sufficiently flexible to deal with cases of religious hardship. And if there really is a need to tinker legislatively, I think the solution that um, New York City has arrived at is a good solution, which is simply to develop a special hardship standard that deals with um, the interest of not-for-profit entities. Um, at the same time, I do think it's important um, to recognize the unique problems that are faced by religious property owners. Um, in most cases, they're urban congregations um, faced with um, a, a gradual loss of their congregations to the suburbs. They have huge buildings that are difficult to maintain, um, expensive to repair, and very expensive to heat. Um, and. Uh, they do need some help in dealing with their historic buildings. Um, so I think it is very important that the preservation community try and work very closely with religious property owners to try and develop constructive solutions, such as the solution that was arrived at in the Boston case, um, to these problems that are faced by religious property owners. Um, my final comment on the property rights issue is that I think preservationists should stay out of interior designations at this point. Um, it really only feeds into the rhetoric of property rights advocates with images of the government regulators dictating what you do inside of your home. Um, and if we have the image of greedy developers to advance our cause, um, the property rights community has the image of interior designations as their Willie Horton, really. Um, while, their, while their interiors are very very much worth preserving, and some of them, the loss of some interiors would, would really be a great loss. I think that if we continue to um, uh, press on interior cases, we're going to end up getting set farther back rather than moving forward. Um, in my remaining time, I think I'd like to leave some time for questions, so I'll just touch on one more issue, and that is I'm going to switch away from the uh, local uh, local courts and into federal law. Um, um, in December of 1991, Congress passed the Intermodal Surface Transportation and Efficiency Act, otherwise known as ICE-T. Um, this is a real significant development. Um, highway programs have historically been some of the most destructive programs in terms of the law of um, uh, destroying historic resources in this country. Um, Ice-T is a, gives $155 billion um, to fund highway improvement and construction projects. Um, but there are a number of features of this new law that I think are really distinct improvements under our old highway program. Um, and I think it's, this is a law that people in the planning community in particular are going to um, be learning a lot about in the, in the next uh, few months and years. First, under, under the new law, every state must spend 10% of the money they received, which is $2.5 billion altogether, for what are called transportation enhancements. And enhancements include scenic highways programs, historic preservation, control of outdoor advertising, rehab of transportation facilities such as railroad railroad depots, landscaping, bike paths, and even acquisition of scenic and historic sites. In addition, the new law gives state and local governments more flexibility in spending their funds, which reduces the existing built-in bias there is toward um, road building as opposed to alternative forms of transportation, such as highways, such as mass transit or um, uh, non-construction techniques to reduce traffic congestion. And finally, um, the law requires that transportation planning be coordinated with community comprehensive planning. And this in and of itself is just a huge change um, from the way transportation planning is currently run, since currently there's little or no coordination, and instead um, transportation decisions are made essentially on an ad hoc basis. Um, I think this coordination will help to make wiser transportation decisions. Um, uh, 
And taken as a whole, I think ICT makes significant changes in the way the transportation will be carried out all over the country. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's a real change in attitude um, on the part of uh, top officials at the Department of Transportation, although it's going to take some time for this change of attitude to trickle down to rank and file transportation planners. Um, because it's just very different from what the Transportation Department has been about in the past. Uh, it is important for people in the preservation and the planning community to keep the pressure on DOT and to spend the funds so that they make sure that they spend the funds, particularly those enhancement funds, on, in, on appropriate projects. I think I'm going to wrap it up now so that if you have some questions, um, feel free. Um, what I've tried to do is, is just summarize a few of the major developments in preservation law. It's by no means a complete picture. Um, and instead, it's just a, uh, a couple of photographs of some of the major issues. Um, keep, keeping in mind that this picture is likely to change, um, particularly when the U.S. Supreme Court issues its decisions in the property rights uh, cases, and as other courts around the country consider new preservation uh, controversies. So stay tuned. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Malcolm. Well, we try and get involved in the major takings cases even the ones like the Yee case and the Lucas case that don't directly implicate um, preservation regulations. And our role is generally as a friend of the court. So, for example, in the Lucas case, we filed a friend of the court brief with the U.S. Supreme Court. And um, in the Yee case, we also filed a brief. In battles such as in the Virginia legislature, um, we had uh, literally a, a SWAT team that went down from our national office to um, uh, try and counter lobby in the legislat uh, legislature to try and defeat this owner consent requirements. So we do try and, and be um, wherever there is a, a need, particularly where there is an um, issue that could set a damaging precedent for um, other communities in the country. Yes. I think I made that statement in the context of picking our preservation battles. I think that communities that politically can um, should uh, designate and protect important interiors, and particularly um, movie palaces like the, the Boyd Theater in Philadelphia was a classic example. It, it was literally described as an ugly theater on the outside, but it was just magnificent on the inside. Um, the problem is that in this climate, um, once you get to the point where the property owners and the regulators are so polarized that they cannot come to an agreement um, through the administrative process that is facilitated by most preservation regulations, and you get into court, you've got cases where the optics are very, very bad, and you end up with a decision like um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which started with an interior case and went so far beyond that to literally invalidate all preservation regulation in the, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So it's not a statement about the importance of interiors, but more the defensive posture that the preservation community is in now um, and the fact that we do have to pick battles that are likely to move us forward rather than move us back. Well, I guess my comment was that it, we did pick that battle, and it really backfired on us. Um, I think if there is a, another interior designation case, and I'm not saying that interiors shouldn't be designated if it's, po if, 
you know, if there's a political will to do that. But if there's another interior designation case, the National Trust would probably not want that case to go up to the state Supreme Court um, because we are so fearful of, of getting another Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision. I think that the only way is to try and develop enough persuasive arguments um, that we can present to legislatures um, and hopefully to present to courts um, that can persuade them that interior designation serves important public purposes and that um, as a community there will be a great loss if these interiors are allowed to be destroyed. Um, but again, it's something that you know, the lawyers are just not, don't have the tools to help out on this battle. It's one of who has the most persuade, who has the rhetoric, who has the arguments that um, counterbalance this awful image of the government telling you that you can't move a mirror from one side of the wall to another. Yes. I think that um, there are a number of coalitions that have been developing on a national level um, to try and get materials to um, uh, communities and planners that, you know, essentially provide packages for how you apply for an, uh, an enhancement program. And I think the most important thing is to just be aware of the fact that these funds are available and if there's a major transportation project that's being planned, you know that 10% of that money has got to go to enhancements. And um, just start talking to the transportation folks and let them know that you know that those funds need to be used for non-construction non enhancements. Um, and there, there's actually an organization called the Surface Transportation Project, which is um, located in Washington um, uh, that is um, recently formed first the lobby for the transportation law and now is actually um, gearing up to provide technical assistance to um, communities on how to, how to plan um, enhancement projects and to uh, make the best use of the law. Um, so I think that's that's the way it's going to work. Well, the funds are now there, so it, it would not affect would not affect transportation projects that had been in the works before the passage of the law. Um, what it will do is that any time there's a new transportation project. Um, where federal funding is applied for after December of 1991, um, that will be the point at which, um, um, at which these, uh, this new preservation law kicks in. Um, and uh, they could, you know, it could be any day, really. Yes. Well, I'm not sure I can answer that on the state state level. Um, there are a, are a few cities that have um, really been models for the preservation world. Um, one is Charleston, South Carolina, um, and that really has been um, attributable to the fact that um, I think the political leaders of Charleston understand where their bread is buttered um, and. I think a lot more communities will probably understand the tremendous amounts of money um, that are brought in by heritage tourism programs. Um, and once they understand that their historic, um, the historic character of their communities is actually um, an economic advantage rather than a liability, um, then those are the cities that have really strong, really good preservation programs. But the political will really has to be there. I've seen it in, in Charleston. Savannah has a strong preservation program. Um, there are a number of communities that have very strong um, 
preservation laws. I was just hearing tonight from David Baker about um, the very strong preservation law that's in um, Indianapolis, for example. Um, and uh, um, that's, I think, you know, an indication of a good, a good um, political will there that they're able to keep strong local ordinances that provide substantive protections for historic properties and actually give um, preserva preservation officials the authority to stop um, demolitions or harmful alterations um, if they find that they're either inappropriate or not justified dollars-wise. Now, It has presented a different issue, and, and the, reason, um, the reason is, I mean, it presents a much more difficult issue. Um, the fairness aspect in rural areas um, becomes very acute um, in the issue of open space zoning, um, uh, that more acute than in a, a city. Um, and I think the reason for that is that in a city where the dwellings are much closer together, you can understand basically the reciprocity of advantages of preservation, which means that I, I'm restricted on my ability to demolish or make changes in my historic house, but I'm also benefited by the fact that my cross the, the street neighbor um, um, is likewise restricted in that to make sure that I don't have a hole in front of my house or an inappropriate uh, structure or a huge building um, in my neighborhood. But that same um, mutuality of benefits is not as immediately apparent when you're dealing in a rural area, um, which is where most open space zoning um, cases usually arise. And instead, the unfairness aspect of it is very apparent because you have a farmer you know, who has the same plot of land that looks just like his neighbor's, but he's in an area that's zoned for open space and his neighbor is not, and his neighbor is making a lot of money. Um, uh, selling his land, and he can't. Um, so that's when I think the political issues become different. The legal issues are the same, um, but it's the political issues that I think are the most troubling ones. Yes. Can you speak up? Not much. Well, I'm not sure I understand your question, but if you're suggesting that um, that the intent of uh, of preservation could be achieved without being overly restrictive, um, I think that's a very good suggestion. I think we get into a lot of trouble by um, historic um, district commissions that really, you know, as some people would describe it, go power crazy, um, and they get in involved in endless debates about, you know, the type of molding that you should use or um, uh, minutia of, um, uh, of, uh, of, of the uh, fixtures in a, in a building. And um, they, I think in many cases that um, that can really be a liability it gives us a very bad reputation of being, um, you know, overly subjective. First of all, and, and second of all, um, just very um, restrictive, overly restrictive, overly expensive. Um, so I, I think you know, preservation commissions really are operate best where they can see, as you say, um, the, the forest uh, for all the trees, and um, they don't get sort of bogged down in, in, in details. I think that will serve them very well. I, I saw a hand over there first. Did you have a question? Uh. 
Yes to both questions. Yes, um, the same arguments would apply, but yes, there is a distinction. Um, the distinction between, usually it's landmark designation as opposed to historic di district de designation and zoning, is again the issue of reciprocity of benefits. In zoning, you know that if you're in an area that's zoned for residential use, everybody in that area is zoned for residential use. But if you're a landmark, you know, you, you're the only property owner that may um, possess the, the characteristics that make it um, significant as a landmark. So you may be the only one that's restricted. So you could, if there's no overlaying zoning, you know, you could be in a situation where you are restricted to your two-story um, building while all your neighbors, such as in the Grand Central, case around you are building skyscrapers and making a lot of money. So that's um, that's the uh, difference that, and the legal significance that's attached to that difference is um, the analogy that um, uh, that's often made um, to zoning, which is that landmark designation is like spot zoning, which is illegal. Um, and um, uh, Justice Brennan in the Penn Central decision rejected that argument and said, no, even when you have individual landmarks scattered along the city, if, uh, if they're part of a comprehensive plan for landmark protection, there is still that mutuality of benefits that, um, that makes uh, landmark designation not like legal spot zoning. Um, and once you get over that hurdle, then the takings analysis is identical in the zoning context and in the preservation context. Yes. Well, the National Trust has a pretty active program for heritage tourism, and we, we, we try to work with communities on a, a number of pilot projects, um, which I don't know which the communities are, but um, they do have a, a program that works with them to try and develop heritage tourism um, uh, projects. Um, and I think that as a whole, um, I, a lot of preservation organizations, and, and the National Trust is very keenly aware of the tie-in between um, preservation and economics. In other words, we know that we're not going to be able to persuade um, most people that they should preserve their heritage because it's a good thing to do. Instead, we do have to persuade um, most communities that they should preserve their heritage because it makes financial sense. Um, so that's the tactic that we're using. We, not only do we use it in trying to develop heritage tourism pro programs, we also have a program called our Main Street program, which is um, an unusually successful program because of what it does is it tries to counteract the fact that many small town Main Streets um, are simply dying um, and uh, uh, merchants are no longer finding it economically viable to continue their businesses in small downtowns, and as, as a result, they are literally, you know, deteriorating.